Um, my name is Stephanie, in case we haven't met Stephanie Wang, um, and I am Pastor Keith's daughter, so <laughs> that's my connection here, <laughs> and I've also been here for a long time. Um, also known as Ellie's mom, so that's who I am. Um, but today I'm going to talk to talk with us about our work and glorifying God at work, specifically just glorifying God in our Monday through Friday life, right? So thinking, you know, when you wake up on Monday morning, what is it that you set out to do? What is your assignment? And how can you honor God in that? So that's what we're going to be diving into today. And a lot of my examples today are going to be kind of corporate work examples, because that's a bit of my season of life. Uh, but if you're not currently working, or if you're a stay-at-home mom, or you know, if you do like gig work, or you know, it looks very different than the corporate work life, I just ask that you creatively ap apply <laughs> some of those examples to your context. Um, but take the principles um, which uh, you know apply to all of us, really. Uh, so that's kind of just a quick introduction to what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to consider what, what does it mean to glorify God in our work, and what does it mean to glor bring glor glory to God in a secular context? So specifically thinking about um, secular work environments. Now I read this week that the average person spends 90,000 hours at work over the course of their lifetime. And this, to me, was a lowball average. I've also seen estimates that it's about 13 years of your life that you spend working. Um, and hopefully that's paid working, but I'm sure a lot of that's also unpaid work. Um, and that, again, for Northern Virginia also seems like a lowball estimate to me. <laughs> we work a lot in this area. And so, you know, it's a huge chunk of your life. Now, most of the time, I get it. Like, we're counting the hours, we're watching the clock, it's just the mundane drudgery of it all. Um, there's the colleagues you like, and there's the colleagues you don't like so much. There's the bosses you try to work for, and then the ones that you kind of try to get off of their projects really quickly. Um, and, and there are many days that I think to myself, well, there's a reason somebody is paying me to do this work, because they don't want to do it themselves. Um, and, you know, you may or may not like what you're doing all the time, right? Even if you have a job that you like, there's going to be that 25% that it's, you know, you just got to do what you got to do, right? Um, so it's always a bit of a mixed bag for all of us. But how can we not neglect those work hours and actually live for Christ in that time? Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. It says this. It says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will, not so that you will have the right response for everyone. So we're to make the most of every opportunity. And some translations say re redeem the time, use that translation, um, or redeem the the kairos time, which means that you're recognizing the moment, you're recognizing the opportunity that you have, and you're doing the right thing at the right time, right? It's that kind of appropriateness. It's responding appropriately um, in that season. So we're to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Now, of course, in our jobs, we have work to do, right? It, there's practical work we have to do. And so when I say glorifying God in our work, I'm not saying that we need to be closing our eyes, praying all day, or being super spiritual in that way, um, or that, you know, every conversation with somebody is you're sharing the gospel. Like, that's not practical, right? You, you need to actually do your job. <laughs> um, and there's, you know, there's a reason that you're hired, or um, there's tasks to complete, there's stuff to do, there's deadlines that you have to meet. And, you know, you have to learn and upskill. You have to navigate the politics. Like, all of that is, is just the way it is, right? But, at least for myself, it's very easy to become consumed by all of that work and consumed by what I need to do that I neglect the spiritual component of my work. And there is a spiritual component of your work. We, we are whole beings, right? We are body, soul, and mind, and spirit. 
And I know there's a lot of buzzwords these days about bringing your whole self to work. But if you think about it, it's very easy for us to bring our mind to work, right? We bring the skills, we bring the knowledge that we know, um, we bring, you know, the things that we've been taught. So we bring our minds into work on a, on a daily basis. Of course, we bring our bodies to work, right? We're physically present or, you know, or maybe we're building things or we're doing things with our hands. Like there's, it's pretty clear, like the, the body and mind, you know, bringing that side of yourself to work. But what about soul and spirit, right? We should also be bringing our soul and spirit into it. There's a spiritual component. It's that sense that we're worshiping God through what we're doing. We can honor and glorify him. So how this looks like for me personally, and again, I'll ask that you apply this to your context. Whenever I start a new job or I'm at a new office or whatever the new thing is, my prayer, my first prayer is basically two questions is what it boils down to. It's, God, what are you doing here? And then the second question is, how can I be a part? Now, my assumption is that God is doing something. So my first question is, God, what are you already doing here? If God is everywhere, if he's omnipresent, he's already present there, he's already at work, he may already have other Christians stationed there at that company. You know, maybe he's already been drawing people by the power of his Holy Spirit. Maybe someone has been praying for that person that you're going to be seated next to. And so God is already doing something. He's already active. And so my first question is just that awareness. God, what are you already doing here? I'm asking God to open my eyes to the work of his spirit and asking him to make me sensitive to his leading and aware of his presence. God positions each of us in a place for a time, right? It's that Esther concept of you've been placed for such a time as this. And so I ask, and I invite you to also ask, God, what are you already doing at my work? Open my eyes to your kingdom work. And then the next question is the response, right? How can I be a part? God strategically places us, as I said, he directs, he directs us to a specific job or a specific contract, right? He opened the door. He gave favor with that manager or he gave favor with um, the person who wants to bring you on as a consultant, right? He gave you favor in that way. And so he's already been positioning you. Maybe he's prompted you to start that business. Like whatever it is for your, con for your context, God has strategically placed you. He's had you learn that skill so you'd be put on that project so that you could be with that person, right? God isn't wasting our time. And he, he knows what he's doing, right? So we just have to be made aware of it and then participate, join in with him. So my challenge is for us to ask him for clarity. Ask God, what are you already doing here? And how can I be a part? Walking by the Spirit, living out the Christian faith, it applies to every aspect of our lives, right? It applies every day of our lives, every hour of our lives. And so we can, we can walk by the Spirit, whether it's at a nonprofit, whether it's by, you know, serving in the community, whether it's in our neighborhood, whether it's at our work, whether it's in our homes. The first key is to become aware of what God is doing. The second key is to join in. So notice his presence as you log into your computer, as you walk into your office. That simple intentionality and awareness is the first step. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17, it kind of sums this idea up. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through 17 says, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us reveals the knowledge, the fragrance of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of God, a fragrance of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? We are not like the many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. So it's that sense that you carry literally the smell of Jesus with you and when you walk into a room. You carry his fragrance, his odor, and you're bringing the knowledge of God, the knowledge of Christ. Now, there are three points that I want to convey that, again, apply to every single person in this room if you're a Christian. The first is this. 
As a Christian, you operate in the gifts of the Spirit. The second, as a Christian, you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And the third is, as a Christian, you are kingdom-driven in your purpose. So we operate in the gifts of the Spirit. We exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And we are kingdom-driven in our purpose. So what does this look like when we apply it, especially to a secular environment? The gifts of the Spirit. So when I say that we operate in the gifts of the Spirit, what I mean is this. Gifts of the Spirit are supernatural gifts from God, right? So it's not something that you can just do on your own, uh, that you can do out of your own ability or comes from your own knowledge. It's, a, it's beyond the natural. It's supernatural. It's what God gives you uh, as he wills. The gifts of the Spirit are kind of sprinkled throughout the New Testament and, well, all of Scripture, but uh, especially in 1 Corinthians 12. So if you're interested in this topic, that's where I would first direct you, right? 1 Corinthians 12. And it lists out these ones. It lists wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous power, prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking in other tongues, and interpreting tongues. So the Holy Spirit gives us, gives Christians these gifts to serve the church and also to build the kingdom. This means we operate in the gifts of the Spirit, and we can see God do supernatural things both inside uh, the walls of the church and outside the walls of the church. Jesus sets the example of this, right? He preached and he ministered both inside and outside of the synagogue, right? He was raising the dead. He was healing people, casting out demons. He was doing miracles even just out in the streets, right? It wasn't just limited to the religious context. So the supernatural, and we see the same thing, right, with Paul and the apostles, the, the early church, too. Um, in the book of Acts, we see them ministering to people. We see them doing miracles, even just as they're out in the streets. So the supernatural work of the church, it wasn't confined to the church or just a religious environment. And so we, too, can be listening to the leading of the Spirit and operating in the gifts of the Spirit in our Monday through Friday, really our Sunday through Friday, <laughs> the whole, whole week life. One very simple example um, is a few months after I started at my current company, um, I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of the directors, and this was just a regular check-in. You know, he's just asking how I'm doing and, you know, the usual one-on-one -on -one conversations. And um, when he asked how things were going on my contract, I was like, actually, I'm enjoying this contract. It's been really fun. <laughs> um, and... Uh, every project is different. I like the challenge. It's, it's great. And he was really surprised. <laughs> he, he looked at me and he was like, Stephanie, I have never heard anyone use the word fun for the contract that you're on. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we, we moved on, talked about other things, but I reflected on that later and, and I thought, you know, well, why is that so weird? Like, you know, <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. But then I realized that in that season, I had been really intentionally dedicating my projects to God. And it, this is, I'll really outline like what it actually looks like for me. So I would get on the phone with a client and right before the phone call, I would pray over that conversation. And it was one or two minutes, super fast. Um, and I just say, God, you know, I pray over um, this conversation that you would give me the right questions to ask. I pray a blessing over this person that I'm going to talk to. You know, like a one-minute, very quick prayer. And then we'd, we'd have the phone call. They'd outline what they want me to do. Great. You know, close the, the phone. And, and before I would even start on the project, I have, I have the assignment in front of me. And I would look at it, and I would pray over the assignment now. And I would say, God, you know, I give this project to you. Lead my research. Show me the divine insights that you have. Give me supernatural solutions to any challenges that I'm going to face on this project. I'm yours. This project is yours. Be glorified in the work. And that's it. It's a very short prayer, right? It was something like that every time. Um, just a quick prayer of dedication and a quick invitation for God to lead and to speak. And indeed, the work was really challenging. <laughs> it was definitely actually beyond my abilities at the time and quite tedious a lot of the time. But God was giving me creative ideas. And with each new project, I was coming up with solutions that I had never even 
seen anyone else do before, right? And it wasn't me, it was God. He was speaking through me. He was leading the research and the writing, and he was also giving me a lot of favor along the way. So I invite you to prepare your heart to see what God is doing at your workplace, to listen to the nudge of the Spirit. And it's not that God answers our prayers every time, right? It's not that every project is 100% win. There are bad things that are going to happen, like you won't have favor with everybody. Um, and, and certainly there are times that you have real trouble at work. But for me, in that season, God was teaching me how to walk in, in the gifts of the Spirit, right? So he was, giving, he was being really gracious in that season. And I think he can do the same for you too, right? If you've never tried this before, if you've never invited God into your projects or into your work or into your conversations with colleagues or managers, um, I, I challenge you to do that and see what God does. Start to notice how God can lead you and speak through you. When we give our lives to Jesus, Jesus fills us with his Holy Spirit. His Spirit dwells in us as believers. And that means that we have this direct access to his creative ideas and his solutions. We have access to his problem solving, his wisdom, his understanding, and insight from God himself. So you will encounter problems and challenges at work. You will have politics to navigate, all those things. And there's going to be times you're frustrated with the leadership. You don't agree with the direction. Whatever it is, like we're human, those are all going to happen. Sometimes you're going to hit a bug in the code you cannot resolve on your own. You're going to need to pull someone else in. Sometimes there's a customer who is completely unreasonable. But God, he knows the full extent of the problem, even beyond what you know. And he also knows everything that that other person is going through. And he knows the best solution. So why would we not come to him and ask him for help? So we seek God for wisdom. We seek him for courage. We seek him for strength. And he is really generous. He gives good gifts to his children. And he blesses us for our obedience to accomplish his purposes in the world. So that's a little bit about walking in the gifts of the Spirit. I'd like to turn now to thinking about the fruit of the Spirit. How do we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in our workplace? Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So as we walk in the gifts of the Spirit, we also should be exemplifying the fruit of the Spirit. And I was talking to my dad about this this week, and he was mentioning that, you know, in secular work environments, we often... We talk about the soft skills and the interpersonal skills and servant leadership and, and these sorts of things. And to the Christian, this should be something we're already doing. <laughs> it should be equivalent to us really walking in the, the fruit of the Spirit and um, being disciples of Jesus. So we, we should really be like some of the best employees or best bosses or best business owners or best parents or whatever. Um, and I know that's maybe a bit pie in the sky to say it that way, but we should be exhibiting that fruit already in our work. We follow Jesus' example of servant leadership, of showing love. He is the origin of the entire concept of servant leadership, right? When someone brings that up at work, that comes from Christ. He's the one who started. He washed the disciples' feet. And so if we are following, we're, we are following the original servant leader directly. That means we can model his example in whatever secular environment that we're in. It could mean serving others, lifting other people up, encouraging people, treating everyone with respect and humility, whether or not they treat you with respect back. This means having patience with people, especially you know new hires or uh, people who are of a gener different generation than yourself, having that patience and generosity means bringing the peace of God into contentious environments. We're peacemakers as Christians. It means having self-control when there are difficult people to work with. And it means we don't just chase paychecks. 
we're answerable to God. And as such, we should be honest, reliable, trustworthy. We should do all things with this integrity before Christ. We work as unto God, and our work is worship to him. We have this God-given, time-tested, ethical, moral principles from Scripture that should be shaping and guiding our behavior and our attitudes. So we should be reflections of Christ in our workplace. This means not acting out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, considering others as better than ourselves, as Paul mentions in Philippians. And sometimes this goes against culture, and sometimes we're going to screw up, right? I think of one example where um, I was in some, I've had several workplaces where gossip was the norm. (laughs) And there's one particular example where I was getting really frustrated with a colleague. It had been building over time. And I, I got on the phone with a different colleague, and we were talking about some something, and um, it came up, and, and I just started venting, right? Like, <laughs> it just came out, and I couldn't stop myself, and I regretted it as soon as it did, but just kept digging that ditch. And I got off the phone, and I was immediately convicted by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> like, that was not, I went too far. Um, and so, you know, I repented before God, and God was like, well, you need to repent before that person. <laughs> um, so... After a few hours, I finally got the courage, and I called her up, and I called up the person I had been talking to, and I just said, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, I should have not said those things. That was, I went too far. That was, that was gossip, pure and simple, and I don't want to be a colleague who gossips and who talks about people behind their back. Like, I want to, you know, be a person that um, has integrity, um, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and it was a very quick conversation, and then um, she hung up the phone, and, and it was fine, but... You know, I had to have that humility and repentance before God. And it wasn't until kind of looking back on that situation that I realized there was kind of a turning point with that colleague that I had apologized to, where before we had not really worked together that often, and she had not really wanted to bring me into projects. And around that time was when she started actually pulling me into projects and actually entrusting me with the work that she was on. And so I think it really was, it wasn't just that she was starting to see my work quality, but also that she was starting to see that character there. And that was that turning point. And so, you know, we, we obey the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and that can build trust with people. And that also exemplifies Christ too, right? When we, when we mess up, how do we respond to that? Are we reflecting Christ in our response? So we... We have the gifts of the Spirit. We have the fruit of the Spirit. And the third thing that I want to bring across is that we have a kingdom-driven purpose. And this, to me, is really what differentiates the believer from the unbeliever at work, is that we have this higher mission, this higher purpose. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. It says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the household. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So it's not just that they see you or they see how great your light is. Your light should be a reflection of Christ. You should be like the moon reflecting the sun, right? And they should be pointed to the Father when they see your good deeds. Christians who work and operate in secular environments, we have this eternal purpose motivating us. We are mission-driven people. And I don't mean that in the corporate sense or the government sense. We are mission-driven in an eternal sense. So we don't just count on the minutes or work to pass the time. We actually have purpose in our work. We are reflections of Christ himself, and we bring light into dark circumstances. I'd like to read from Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 17. Ephesians 5, verses 8 through 17. It says, For you were once darkness... But now you are light in the Lord. And worship team, you can come up and start playing in the background. 
For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. That same phrase we heard at the beginning, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. We are ambassadors of Christ. We are literally his people sent on his mission to reach the lost. We are sent into whatever environment that you're sent into, right? Whatever your Monday looks like, whether that's a boardroom or a construction site whether that's a government agency, whether that's a hospital or a classroom or even your home where you're teaching your children, whatever it is that you are sent into, God has given you an assignment for your Monday through Friday life. He has called you to be his representative to whatever circle of influence you have. So are you reflecting the light of Christ? Are you the light of Christ? Are you like the moon reflecting the sun? Are you driven to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Are you walking with Jesus into your Monday, Monday morning? So I'd like to take a few minutes for us to respond, uh, maybe five minutes or so. And you can. there's a couple ways that you could respond. The altars are, are open if you want to come up for prayer. Um, also, you know, you have the back of your card if you want to jot something down. Um, but I'd like to give us all a couple minutes to kind of consider what God is speaking to us in this moment. So I invite you to, especially if you're writing something down, write down one thing that stood out to you. Write one action item for yourself. So maybe one of your colleagues came to mind or one of your bosses came to mind as I was talking. And so you're going to maybe write down their name and pray for them this week. And at some point, maybe even reach out to them and say, hey, I'm praying for you. You can even ask them what they want prayer for. Um, but being very intentional with that prayer. Maybe you're going to write down a project or a problem that you're facing right now in your work. Maybe something you can't solve on your own, something that's beyond yourself. And you're going to be asking God to give you the gift of his spirit and give you that divine knowledge or insight or understanding or wisdom for that project. Maybe you need a new job and that's what you're going to be writing down. You're asking God for some grace in the process and for provision. That's also a great prayer to write down. Maybe there's a scripture that stood out to you or a thought or a question that you're going to be meditating on all of this week. So I invite you to, to write that down. Um, but either way, I want us to take a moment to respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to whatever he's speaking to us. And so, you know, feel free to jot something down and then kind of seal it in prayer before the Lord. Um, or if you want to come up for prayer, that's fine too. Um, so let's take a minute to, to respond to the Holy Spirit. 